new ideas and lifestyles, how reluctant we are sometimes to accept them. Some examples from history. Henry Ford said, you can have any color car you want as long as it's black. They told Orville and Wilbur, if the Lord had intended man to fly, he'd have given him wings. And remember the handkerchief makers years ago who said, nobody is going to blow his nose on a piece of paper and throw it away. What happened to Kleenex? Anyway, and in 1936 and again in 1946, Birmingham City Fathers told Delta Airlines they couldn't put their headquarters in Birmingham because we didn't need them. We had U.S. Steel. Well, the list goes on and on and on. Now, computers, they are here, a fact of life. But a lot of us are intimidated by all that hype and confusion, so we back away from it. Today, we begin a series of classes with our instructor, Fred Dignazio, to learn about computer terms. We call it Morning Show Computer 101. Fred, welcome back. Now, we're gonna, you're gonna, this thing is going to intimidate me, and it's going to intimidate a lot of folks out there. So it's not all that bad, is it? Not a... No, I thought what we'd do, too, is we got a computer here that is the sleekest. It's the latest computer. It's the Amiga computer. And uh, we borrowed it from Command Computer over mm -hmm. in Village East across from Century Plaza. All right. But we're going to move away from the computer just for a second. And we're going to go to something familiar here, a record album uh -huh. and a record. And the key to making any computer work is software. And so this is software. And I think it's something everybody out here isn't the least bit intimidated, intimidated about. I thank you for doing it because my wife said yesterday, what is software? Software I is... As opposed to hardware. Well, the program you play on your record <coughs> record player is music. On, right. Your on a, record would be software. On a record. Then. Right. On a tape cassette, your software is the tape. And again, it's music, sounds, voices, or what have you. Now, on a computer, it's just a little bit different. It comes on these little discs. Mm -hmm. We have one here. Yeah. Now, some... Times they were called floppy disks, but now there's a new little disk, a rigid disk. So I don't think the term floppy works anymore. But again, you have stored in here magnetically information, sounds, pictures, what have you. And well, wait so, a minute, let's back up. Who okay. stored it in there? How does, how does it get there? That's right. It had to be stored by a programmer at some time. And the programmer could be either you working on your personal computer, or it could be stored at a factory by the manufacturer and then sold over the counter. Uh, at a local computer store or discount store. So whatever information I wanted to put on the computer to call it up at some future date, I would put on here and I would type it all in there and it would record on there. That's right. And you make a good point because a record, of course, you cannot store anything new on. You have to go with what you've got at the store. A tape cassette, though, I think is more like a computer disc because you can put your own software mm -hmm. on the tape cassette. Now, the next step for us is to actually load the software, and to do that, there's a little hole, just like a player uh, on a tape cassette mm -hmm. player or a record player turntable, where there's a little device called a disk drive in the computer. And you take the software, you can do it here, All right. and push it into that hole there until it clicks. All right. And now you've loaded the software, and the computer records what's going on on its picture screen. So here we have a picture of a disk that is known as the workbench disk to the computer. And you can take this device over here, Tom. This is known, you might want to hold it up. Mm -hmm. This is known as a mouse. And there's a whole new generation of what we call mouseketeers. <laughs> and right. you're going to become a mouseketeer I'm today. I'm going to be a mouseketeer. Well, where are my ears? <laughs> <laughs> well, here, here are the mouse ears, my... <laughs> and I will have to do with those. Now, your left mouse ear allows you to select things. And turn the mouse over, and we'll show people what a mouse really is. Underneath it is just this little ball. As that ball rolls around on the table and makes contact with the table, it allows this little arrow up here to move around on the screen. You can do that now. All right, now. let's do that now. All right, here we go. Move that arrow. Be There's a mouseketeer and move Anywhere your arrow. I move it. I can move it. In. All right. Okay. And then the left button up there will allow you to select things. So why don't you point at the disc. Point at the disc. And I, press two let times Let me do that again. Quickly. Here we go. Get here we my go. arrow up there. And I press what? Twice? Two times quickly. There's a little zzz, which means the computer is busy. Uh -huh. And up here, and you have a window. I can hear the computer is a little bit busy. It's the little disk its there. Its wheels are clicking. So All right. It's recalling the information from the disk we just loaded on. Mm -hmm. Now we have several drawers. One thing I want to make a point about now is that computers, in an effort to try to be easier or, quote, user-friendly, have tried to make the screen look more like a desktop that we're familiar with. So as you can see here, we have... We have lots of drawers, file drawers, so we all have filing cabinets. Mm -hmm. Inside those drawers are programs that you can use. Right. Over here is a trash can where you throw away 
information you don't need. <laughs> okay, the file 13. Okay, and we have a clock that would allow you to keep track of what's going on. Now, why don't we open one of your file drawers, your now, utilities drawer. i my mouse drawer. over here. All right, you point right over at utilities, all the way over. I can't get my now, mouse. Pick up, that's a good okay. thing you learn as a mouseketeer, is pick up the mouse and move it back over, and then okay. come forward some oh, more. Oh, I got you. Now. And go on down to utilities. Down to utilities. And then you double click, once you We're point right, there. right and double click. Double click the left one? Uh-huh. And that will open the utility store and it becomes a new window. It's all like right. a new When you say of... utilities, I could put all my Alabama Power Company bills in there, my gas company bills, and my oh, phone that's bills right. and things like that. That's right. That's that's a, a, the common way we think of utilities. But it also, on a computer, means certain tools that you would use. Mm -hmm. And for example, a notepad and a calculator. Why don't you double click notepad? All right. And now we'll got, open that. Now, okay. this is your first program. Before we've been opening drawers. Yeah. Now, this now is a, here's a program, a notepad program. All right. The Z's indicate that it is working. That's right. And what you'll have here is an empty notepad, an electronic notepad. Okay. Why don't you type something on the screen, just um, on the typewriter keyboard? Okay. It's Excuse something simple. Me back. Yeah, here we go. Uh, blah, blah, blah. And this would be as if you were making a note to yourself that you wanted to recall something for later. Okay. Okay. We'll let folks see this. This is, I want to remember to pay my utility bills. Now, <laughs> I notice you have a little problem with your spelling here, Tom. Yeah, I know, but did I? So we can demonstrate yeah, I something I'm left out a little right bit. off the bat here. If you looked at that and said, that's not quite right, why don't you hit this backspace button? And watch this little, this is called a cursor here on the computer okay. screen. It indicates I want to take that U out, right? your, your position. Right. Yeah. And now what do you want to put in place of that U? A Y. Okay. Right. And go ahead and type space and, and bills again. And what we're showing here is on the electronic screen. Oops. Well, we, we can make even more mistakes. Yeah. And we there can we also instantly correct what we've typed. And so see you fixed what you an e, Remember to it. Well, we, what we could do, <laughs> see, you could go all the way back and you could correct that too. Uh -huh. But it's showing on the electronic screen, you can instantly correct things that you've made. Right. How about one more thing down here, the calculator? Okay, I'll tell you what, let's, while we do okay. this, before I, while I get the mouse down here, uh, we're going to get the mouse on the calculator. We're going to take a break in just a moment and, and come right back. Okay. These are fun to play with, too, <laughs> besides being utilitarian. Okay, Fred Dignazio, our computer connection is here, and we're, we're you are doing computer 101, something that everybody can understand, even me. Now, I have typed a little something in there, then where are we now? We've, we've put the mouse on the calculator, and we've called it up? That's right. First, There's a calculator. That's right, and you, on top of your notepad, you just put a calculator. What you could liken it to is taking paper on top of your desk, and so having lots of different papers. You have a messy desk now. Is yeah, what indeed, you've got, yes, Tom. I can understand so, that. So if you wanted to type more notes on your notepad, you're going to need to move your calculator off the top of your notepad. Right. So you move your little arrow up to the top of that right, box, of the calculator box, and click your button and hold that button down. The left one? Uh-huh. Right. And move your mouse down slowly, and let's see what happens. Yeah, look at that window. That's the window with the calculator. You can move it anywhere you want on the screen. And show folks. It's like moving a page or a piece of paper around on your desktop. Okay. Ah, okay. Now I got that, and I still got that. That's right. So now you could be using go over and well, you could use your your memo pad now mm -hmm. and type something new, or you could go over and do some calculations. Why don't you press a couple number keys, and we'll show folks how the display on the top. Right, how about the six? All right. See, so it's just like a little electronic calculator oh, yeah. on your screen. Six, nine, okay. Okay. As you press your mouse, it's the same as pressing the calculator keys. So I guess what this. So this makes this a calculator, albeit rather that's slow. Right. But, uh, that's right. You've got the computer's best ability is to become other tools and devices. So mm -hmm. we this morning have shown how it can become a memo pad mm -hmm. and a calculator. In future weeks, we can show how it could become an actual electronic typewriter. It could become a spreadsheet program that allows you to add up col long columns of numbers. Mm -hmm. It could become a huge filing cabinet. You can throw all of your information into, sort it, organize it, and get it back at your fingertips. All right. Now, these are coming. Let's, let's talk practicality okay. of computers now. 
This, you say, is the sort of the state of the art. This is one of the newest ones out. Yes, that's right. And it's right. getting smaller and smaller. That's the right. The screen, of course, has got to be big enough to accommodate it, but the rest of this stuff here yeah. is becoming smaller. I, I think, yes, that's right. The practical thing about this, Tom, is, is that as you have these new computers come out, people think, well, that the computer automatically does everything. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, let's see if I have one with me. One example I like to give is the ballpoint pen example, is that I say that a computer... All right. Without this software that comes on these diskettes, is like a ballpoint pen without a point. Okay. Uh -huh. So the point being that if you get a computer and you don't buy this software, all right, you're still you? this computer sits there dead in the water. Mm -hmm. It doesn't do anything. So in terms of expenses, there are hidden costs when you get into buying computers. Your first expense is that in addition to this computer. A box right here, which contains the memory and the little microchips that make up the computer, and the keyboard and the mouse, which you get at the base price, all right, which is around fourteen hundred dollars, by the way. You also have to go in the market for a high-resolution color picture screen mm -hmm. if you're going to have a computer that looks like this. Once you buy that, then you start having to shop for discs, your software, to turn your computer into a memo pad a calculator, a typewriter, a filing cabinet, to play games, mm -hmm. to, teach your te to teach your kids. You need to buy software. So this is a hidden cost that you may not know about initially, but which may double or even triple the cost okay. of your computer. Is that sort of like the Gillette uh, syndrome? You remember Gillette said, we'll give them the razors, but they've got to buy our blades. That's right. Is, That's this, right. is this what we're doing with these discs? Well, I think it's the same, too, when you buy a uh, stereo, yeah. uh, okay, is that you initially get it, but then you find yourself collecting record albums. <laughs> give them the stereo, but they've got to buy our records. That's right. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a good analogy. And so you find, as you get more and more into computers, you want it to do more and more things, more and more powerful tasks, and you're spending more and more money. But so it's good to keep that in mind when you take that first plunge. Okay. You know that we're right on the, the, the edge, the cutting edge of, uh, of this technology. And uh, a lot of the people out there are going, ho, 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 ho. But it's going to be a part of your life. And you can just, just like automobiles and uh, sewing machines and things like that, we got better and better and better. And I think the exciting thing is that computers were awkward. They were scary when they first came out. Yeah. They were ones and zeros and just for like a priesthood of experts. Yes. But now they're trying to be as user-friendly as they can, look like a desktop or a trash can or a filing cabinet. And so you, becoming a mouseketeer, I think, is, <laughs> is easier than it, it, than it is. used to be. Now, Fred uses the term user-friendly. That means that you feel comfortable with it, That's and you right. can use it because you consider it a, 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 a tool. I once wrote a book called How to Get Intimate with Your Computer. <laughs> you did? Kind it's of a, racy title It's a there. cartoon book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, what it does is it tells you that when you get that keyboard uh, and the computer, is that you treat it like a sex object or like your automobile or yeah. anything else. Is touch, feel, gut feelings are just as important in a computer is anything else. So how does that keyboard feel? How does, it, does the picture screen look to you? When you get something like this and you put it up here and it transposes from here fingers and here it up there, it's sort of like putting your foot, the pedal to the metal. That's right, and the you feel pedal it. to the metal. Right. And you get a feeling, and if you have a good feeling, you're going to want to use that computer. You're going to learn more about software. Yeah. But if you have a bad feeling, it's not your fault. It means that the computer wasn't designed properly. All right. We're going to continue this uh, next week. Fred will be back, and we'll uh, have part number two of this, Becoming Friendly and Becoming User-Friendly with Your Computer. Thank you, Fred. Fred Dignazio. We'll be back following this and talk about uh, cosmetics for black skin. Okay, we're in computerology, and this is 101. Fred Dignazio is back with us again. He's our computer uh, specialist, and we want to show you something very dramatic. We're talking about miniaturization. Hey, here's something we're waiting for. Go ahead, bring it right on oh, in. Wonderful. There you go. Okay. That was a <laughs> software, piece of software that we had to have. But first of all, I want to show you something very dramatic. We're talking about little chips that are running the world now. Fred has a little chip hidden somewhere. I want to show you how big it is. This is the chip we're talking about. This is a blown-up picture of a chip. You got it? Okay, now take a look at that. Now, Fred, show them the okay. actual chip. Here, we'll try to get a close up. We get a close up. There, we there are. it is. Everything that's on this big blown up picture here is in that little square. 
and that little square is going to run the world. You can put that down and color it blue. It's going to run the world. Okay, a, mic a, a, a microchip, is that what they call That's it? That's right, Tom. Okay. What we what have here is the brains of this big computer that sits on a desk. Everything, as you've been saying, is smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's yeah. because that chip is so small. Mm -hmm. The brains of the outfit is so tiny and everything else can be small. Now, we're going to see how you build a computer now. Right. We started with that itsy-bitsy little chip, size of a cornflake, and it, it sits inside of a what's called a dip. <laughs> Which is a, a dip? A chip in a dip. Chip in a dip. This is not uh, this <laughs> onion dip okay. or whatever, but this is a, an electronic circuit. Uh, and inside there in the window, you can see that tiny chip, which is a yeah. Motorola 68,000 computer brain. What does 68,000 computer brain mean? 68,000 different messages this thing can... Oh, you're great. I think it's like a snazzy car name, like a Cobra or something uh, like that. They use yeah. big uh, mm -hmm. numbers in the computer business mm -hmm. to suggest speed. This little chip clocks, which means it runs at a rate of 8 million instructions or operations a second. Okay? 8 million operations a second. That boggles the mind. Now, that... now we, take, we take that chip and we put it into this chip and then as you see, it's also known as a bug. Here's another one that looks even more like a bug. Another little I'll give it to you mm -hmm. to hold. Okay. It's an integrated circuit with little tiny legs. It looks like a little black beetle. Right. Plug into a circuit board inside of the computer. And then it's that circuit board that you plug into your electrical outlet that makes the computer work. So okay. this is hardware. This is the core. This is the core of the hardware. You got your circuit board. So we got everything to do. And we had we not taken out this little diskette, the software, the software mm -hmm. that runs the computer. Now, last week we explained all the different things you can do with a software program. And this week Look I brought, if that. we could get a close-up here, of a huge stack of pile of software we've got on the table here. This is to suggest all of the many things you can do with your computer if you buy the software. And so I thought I might show some of the things that you can do, actually starting with this program. All right. Some of the costs involved, you start, you start uh, using software. This is a program that allows you to paint electronically, much as you do here in the studio. Oh, yeah, in the weather. That's the weather right. studio. Okay, Roy that's what Mike Royer does that. That's right. And this costs about $80. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you bought your computer, you bought your picture screen, and now you've got to pay $80 to turn it into a drawing program. Very popular in the olden days, and, and still popular, are programming languages. <laughs> what are you talking olden days? Three weeks ago? This was about three weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Is here's uh, two languages that are popular on computers. One's called Pascal, and another one is called Basic. And these are languages that you type in, you speak to the computer. It knows mm -hmm. these languages if you put in the little disk into the computer's disk drive. Okay, and once you have spoken to the computer now, you, you can, can call it back up at any time. Right. With a certain, okay. and now, the value of these languages is you can do anything with them. You could make a database language for filing information, turn your computer into a word processor. But this involves hundreds or even thousands of hours. Okay, you've said another word expertise. now, database. That knock, knocks us uh, okay. away, too. Well, database, is that like you had a, uh, a notebook full of notes? Yes. And that is your database. You have all the data in this base. And the, the difference is, is that it's like you have little cue cards or indexes on the outside. So you can go to any piece of information Just like instantly. Just like that. Sort of like cross -filing. Right. And that's the use of computers, especially when you're using lots of information. All right. Here, I'll show some quick yeah, prices quickly, here. We need to go through this. Some, people huh. some idea. For a game these days, it costs you about $20 for, for a computer game. There's lots of educational software. Now we're talking about $25 for a little arithmetic program for mm -hmm. your children. Okay. We're talking here. Here's where you turn your computer into a spaceship and go out and meet Halley's Comet. You're going Comet. to Halley's Comet. Okay. Okay. And this is now we're going to run you $40. This is if you're take, your kids are taking the SAT tests and you uh, $30 mm -hmm. to help them brush up for the SAT for college. It won't help you cheat, but it'll help you help That's you right. study, do your um, homework. Here's, now, this is now we're getting older and older. Now we've got adult speed reading. If your reading is slow or what have you, $70 mm -hmm. teach you to become a speed reader. Uh, now we're getting maybe tax time. That's appropriate. Oh, that is appropriate it. for this time of year, yes. But now we're at $40 for a computer program that helps you prepare your income tax mm -hmm. return. All right, you asked about databases. Yeah. It cost you $100 to get something like a database program. This is a, for different models of computers, so folks get an idea. Yeah. Okay, we've got about a half a minute for the rest of it here. All right, well, what we have is it goes all the way up to $400 for an accounting program, and then this giant granddaddy of all of it um, 
is uh, this very popular program called Lotus One Two Three. Mm -hmm. Here it is here, and Lotus One Two Three costs between seven and eight hundred dollars. And all I want to emphasize: all you're getting inside, for all that money, is software. Is this right a little there? tiny diskette is your software for okay. all that much money. This is, you know, I'm beginning to understand computers now. I did not. I was really uh, put off by them because it was intimidating. But the way Fred explains it, you know, I'm beginning to understand the computers. And if I can, I know anybody can. Fred, thank you for being with You're us. Welcome. Now, we will get into word processing. We're going to process some words today, but we got hooked up on this, and we will process some words later. Okay, fine. Okay. We'll be back now following this.